Hello kings, queens, nerds, and geeks. Powder Milk here, and welcome back to Fallout Equestria. Now guys, I'm sorry if my uh, live stream wasn't working earlier, if you guys got that notification. Don't worry about that. Uh, unfortunately, my live stream is not working, so I have to do this by recording. So here I am, back with chapter 29. And sorry guys, I couldn't do it. I'm very sorry. I would love to have your guys' poetry, uh, Oscar, your poetry, and all your guys' comments to respond to. If you guys got anything to say, just remember to say it in the comments and all that stuff, and I'll read them later, and I'll answer them as best as I can if you have any questions or anything, and I do apologize. I do enjoy doing live streams. It's just my live stream recorder has been malfunctioning, and it wouldn't let me live go live. So here I am. Please ignore that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, before, anyway, I'm just going to treat this as if this was live. Hold on. Anyway, let's get on to it. Fuck. You know what irony is? I recognized the voice of Scootaloo, even though it was raspy. Even through all of her coughing, and the mag clicking, and the roar of the wind all about her. Irony is that feeling I spent my whole damned childhood trying to get a cutie mark, and I don't even have it anymore. Irony is that I spent most of the last decade working to save Equestria from a mega spell end of the world. Scootaloo's voice cracked, followed by a barrage of wet, raspy coughs. And then it happened, and I wasn't even fucking here. Broke my damn wing in a stupid damn accident while practicing a new routine for the damn gallops. By the time I got out of the Hanoverian Pegasus Clinic, it was all over. Irony is that I'm the one who made Sweetie Belle the Overmare of Stable 2. I was beginning to worry about her. Now she's probably the only one of us who has survived. I. The recording was interrupted by another fit of coughing. Apple Bloom was supposed to be in Philadelphia. Huh? Can't even get near that place. The pony had died from the radiation in minutes. I was actually considering banging a hoof on Stable 2's door, but then I saw all the bodies. Sweetie Belle did right. Didn't open the door for any pony. Can't let this poison in. Contaminate that whole stable. If I knocked, Sweetie Belle might just open the door for me. And I can't let that happen. Fuck. I'm giving up my pit buck, leaving it here with a message. I figure if Apple Bloom survived, she'll come looking here. If not, some pony else will. Besides, I'm sick of it clicking. I don't need it yelling at me that the snow is radioactive and I'm breathing poison. The air is fucking green. More coughing. Except for those weird pink swirls coming off Candlelot. When you see the air, you know it's bad. This time, the coughing fit lasted minutes. Fuck. That's blood. That, that's, that's not good. They kept telling us the cloud curtain was for our own protection, keeping the radiation and megaspell pollution from getting into Pegasi cities. Who knew that they were telling the truth? Fuckers said the brand is to mark me a sun pony who's been below. Contaminated. Now I know that's horse apples. Told them that. <laughs> Told them I was proud of what Rainbow Dash did. Called myself a Dashite. Boy, that got their feathers in a bunch. Irony is, I worked really hard to find a better way. Some kind of society or government from. or something that would be better. Wouldn't make the same damn mistakes that killed every pony. And I get trapped up there with a whole slew of ponies who seemed dedicated to finding the worst way ever. Even I wouldn't have tried an experiment like the Enclave. The stables aren't set up to fail. Hell, I'd give the Enclave a few months at most. Scootaloo's voice stopped, but no coughing this time. Just harsh breathing. After a moment, she continued. If you find this, before I'm gone. She was cut off by an explosive cough, followed by a few moments of silence, then a groan. If you find this, there's a shack marked on it. I traced Rainbow Dash to there. I think she's living there, or was recently. Wasn't there when I looked, but I'm heading back. Gonna wait there. I hope she returns. I should be there for her. Like she's with me. 
Some pony should be there. Oh, please go to Rainbow Dash's time. sack. Please! Just want Dash to know we didn't... We didn't all. Just that she's not alone. I reverently placed the battered old Pitbuck back into the Rock of Destiny where it rested for nearly two centuries. The Pitbuck of the first Dashite lay once again with the discarded treasures of Dashites to follow. All except for Calamity, whose relinquished possession of his old life we had come to reclaim. At Calamity's hooves lay the black carapace of Enclave armor. The tips of the built-in magical energy rifles flickered with a wicked light. He was an Enclave? She don't rightly belong to me, I reckon, Calamity said. They belong to Captain Deadshot Calamity of the Grand Pegasus Enclave. And he ain't around no more. But after seeing Velvet put on that zebra suit, I figured it's a mite stubborn and foolish of me to not at least drag her out and carry her around with us. In case things get bad enough to call for putting her back on. Calamity looked up at us, face reddened under his rust-colored coat. You know, since we have to repack everything anyway. I nodded, remembering the overturned Sky Bandit in the swath of scattered possessions. Wow. So, my buck was a captain. Velvet Remedy purred, wrapping the Enclave armor with her magic and her buck. off the ground. Her buck! You my wanna buck. get bucked, I'm guessing? I felt the stirrings of a chuckle. I'd been <laughs> sure that Calamity would end up being Velvet Remedy's Calamity, you know what I mean. not the other way around. But the mayor certainly wasted no time. I smiled at both of them. This was good. The whole world was filled with so much bad. My friends needed some good and I was glad they could find it in each other. I thought of homage, and was thankful to her. Without homage, I'm not sure my heart could have ever been so generous. Calamity stammered, blushing harder. Do you want to talk about it? Velvet asked gently, rubbing her head soothingly yet coaxingly against Calamity's neck as she floated the creepy black carapace to their side. Uh, well, she's got quad nova surge raffles, my own design. Here goes my phone again. That's not what I meant. Calamity stared away. I know. He turned back to her. Really, there ain't much to tell. They made me captain, and with the promotion came new duties. I was assigned to lead a wing of scouts down below the cloud curtain. He saw my surprise and explained. The Enclave ain't stupid. They've been sending scouts down here just about twice a year to get the lay of things for ages. Then they put out little reports telling the civilian ponies that the world down here ain't ready for us yet, or the air ain't breathable keeps every pony happy to just fritter away their lives above. Only that ain't how it is out here. Ain't been for a long time. And when I saw that, well, I kind of made waves. Then on my third patrol, I saw a bunch of raiders hitting a caravan. I knew it was coming. Your policy? Yep. Ordered my wing to take the raiders out. They refused. So afterwards, I had them locked up for insubordination. Higher-ups took unkindly to that. Told me they was giving me one chance to correct the path I was on, or they'd be hell to pay. Calamity snorted and dug at the ground with a hoof. They put me in front of an assembly to address every pony and tell them how there ain't nothing down there to save yet. Show them all just how much I was hitched to the party wagon. Velvet Remedy backed up and looked Calamity over. Well, that was foolish of them. Yep. Calamity's muzzle broke into a grin. I reckon it had been so long since some pony had bucked the Enclave that they forgot it could happen. I stood right up there and told every pony what we needed to get down there now. He paused. Well, then, you know what I mean. Anyways, I told them I was leaving, and they were free to follow. Calamity lifted a hoof to scratch his mane under his hat. Didn't hear about how I was supposedly killed my own wing till about six months later. I remembered what Calamity had said back in Philadelphia. Most dictatorships I know of tend to go around hell and high water, either to discredit or destroy opposing voices like that. I trotted over and wrapped a foreleg around Calamity in a hug, which I note was a little tricky since he was a fair bit taller than me. Thanks, little Pip. Something occurred to me. So, I asked Calamity as I dropped it back to all four hooves. Most of the Pegasi don't realize what's going on down here, huh? They ain't bad ponies, little Pip. Calamity whinnied. They're just being bamboozled by the leaders. Even in the best of governments, the ponies at the top don't tell the rank and file what's actually going on. He trotted in place a little. 
You think the better folk in New Appaloosa have any ideas just how connected they were to Red Eyes? I remembered the way the ponies in Turnpike Tavern laughed at the notion of that buck on the Sprite Bots being any pony's leader. On the other side of the bottle cap, I was willing to bet Sweetie Belle didn't tell any pony in Stable 2 about the friends and relatives dying just outside the stable door, breaking their hooves against it as they begged to be let in. Hell, I was supposedly the leader of these ponies, and I was keeping secrets of my own. The truth about the mystery of peace and the mega spells came swiftly to mind. So, I suppose that Calamity's assertion was true. Little Pip, if most of the ponies up there saw for themselves what's going on down here, they'd buck the damn enclave and pony up to help. Calamity's confidence faltered. Well, most being at least more than half, I reckon. I felt an odd tug at one of my saddlebags. I turned to see Velvet Remedy's pit buck float out, enveloped by Velvet Remedy's magic. I watched the polished pit buck, with its custom engraving of Velvet Remedy's singing nightingale, glide across the air and gently sit itself down on the Rock of Destiny next to Scootaloos. I hope it's not presumptuous, she said to Calamity, sounding slightly apprehensive. I'm not a Dashite, but I am leaving an old life behind, and it feels wrong to be taking something out without putting something in that place. Thank you kindly, Calamity responded, approving. I brought the inventory sorter on my pit buck, scrolling through it until I realized with a pang that I didn't have anything from my life in the stable to give up. I stared forlornly at the Rock of Destiny, feeling like I was failing somehow. I'd already left everything in Stable 2 behind. I probably would have sealed a picture of my mother up inside the rock, but I didn't even have that. No. But I did have something. Biting my lower lip, I pulled up the recipe for party time mint owls. I would give this up, but I didn't want anybody else to suffer from them as I had. The first night outside, I had discovered a message from Apple Loom to Sweetie Bell which used a very special encryption. I used that now as I sent the recipe to Velvet Remedy's pit buck. No pony would be able to read the recipe without downloading it from both her pit buck and mine. I erased the recipe from my pit buck. Somehow, it was both liberating and frightening. Damn. Stable 2. I was leaving it again. This time it hurt worse probably because I knew that I would never return, even though I could. I felt weary beyond simple exhaustion. The mental toll of the night before was compounding the physical expense of the battle, and of nearly dying once again. I stared at Calamity, who somehow managed to seem almost normal despite not only having gone through much the same, but also having been up for a full day, much of which was spent dragging the Sky Bandit. Almost normal. He had been ruthless, I was told in hunting down the last of the Steel Rangers. I didn't begrudge him that. But this had been more than his code. More than his policy. We were his closest friends, and he'd taken the assault on our former home personally. Then again, with the exception of Zenith and Pyrelight, we all did. For our own reasons, at least. Calamity, I asked as I floated the Sky Bandit up off the ground. When we first met, you told me you didn't live in New Appaloosa. You said you had a little shack. I had a suspicion. Calamity landed on it and trotted in place. Now weightless, the passenger wagon rolled easily under his hoofs until he had it upright. Yep, he replied. And to answer the next question, yep to that too. Got the marker off the first dash at its pit buck by linking it with my armor, just before giving it up. Did Rainbow Dash ever return to the shack? I mean, do you know? I don't reckon she did, Calamity stated, his words sending a wave of bitter sadness through my heart. When I got there, I found a Pegasus skeleton coat up in a corner which I buried out back. Figure if Rainbow Dash had come back, there would have been two. Another pang shot through my heart. Calamity had done better for Scootaloo than I had for, uh, well, any pony who had passed on. I felt a steely resolve building within my sorrow. Before we go, we should bury the skeletons in the apple cellar tunnel, I said firmly. I know we're on the clock, but damn it if I'm going to leave here again without doing that. Calamity nodded, just like I knew he would. Velvet Remedy trotted closer, levitating another pile of scavenged goods. This would be so much easier if I had a find our stuff spell. You know, 
If we're taking all these detours, we might as well swing by my old place, Calamity suggested. I could gather up a few tools, and little Pip could have a crack at the floor safe no pony's been able to open. There was a twinkle in his eyes when he said that. I heard Velvet stifle a snicker. I faced us. Oh, now that's just not playing fair. The cleanup in the Rock of Destiny had already eaten the first hour of daylight. Wait, so... Wait, 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 wait. So, 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 so before we continue, I, 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 this is so much on my mind right now. This is so much. It's getting me excited. Like, too excited! <sighs> like, Rainbow Dash? Remember this. Rainbow Dash was my first favorite pony. Because my, my favorite pony has changed a lot. Before, first it was Rainbow Dash, then it was Twilight, then Fluttershy... Then it was uh, Applejack for a wh good while, I think. And then there was there was Pinkie Pie, which is currently mine. So, uh, I think my... Oh, and Rarity was pretty awesome for uh, before that, I think. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, seriously, Rainbow Dash was my first favorite pony. And because of this, it's making me really, really excited because there's more information on her. I want to know what happened to her. This was a big question that happens at the beginning of the damn story. Oh my god. Ugh. Like 20 some on chapters later. Here we go. We're going about to get our answer on what happened to Rainbow Dash. There's a safe in there, suit, and we're going to see it. Ugh. Oh god. I hope we can get into the safe. Areas would take up more. We'd be lucky if we made Fetlock by sundown. But then, floor safe. A floor safe in a shack that both Rainbow Dash and Scootaloo had once called home, if extremely briefly, no less. The curious little pony in my head was prancing around eagerly, suggesting all sorts of possibly important or interesting things that might be inside. I shot Calamity a look. You think you can use my weakness against me that easily? Yep. I have stopped. Okay. Yes, you can. But just this once. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> Ultimately, the burials added less than an hour to our departure time. Uh, to be honest, I like Steel's hacking things. I've been playing Fallout 4 more often. To leave until halfway through the effort. I'm glad you're finally with us. A paladin buck named Bitterbright told Steelhoofs that they finally began to march into the Sky Bandit. It should have been sooner, Steelhoofs stated grimly. I should have done this when there was a chance for a peaceful break. This will be a civil war. And a bloody one. Paladin Bitterbright nodded. Star Paladin Crossroads has already locked Elder Cottage Cheese's communications down, and sent out warnings to those in the other contingents who would follow us. With any luck, they'll be able to slip away before word of what happened here reaches the other elders. I swallowed. What happens then? Paladin Bitterbright neighed. If we'd done this years ago, with an elder taking the lead, then those who believed the Steel Rangers should be following the Ministry of Mare and helping the ponies of Equestria could simply have transferred to the new elder's contingent. We would have been looked upon poorly, but the voice of an elder is law. Now. The Steel Ranger outcast took a moment of silence before continuing. Now, we're seceding. We're traitors and mutineers. Once the elders learn of this, any within their ranks who empathize with us will be exterminated. Oh, Celestia grant mercy. Hopefully, Steelhoves added, those who would join us can make it out before then. They'll be galloping towards Stable 29. We will need to have it secured by then, or they'll just be galloping into a trap. Well, except for Trottingham. Night Strawberry Lemonade piped up, joining the conversation as she moved to stand uncomfortably close to Steelhoves. My friend looked around as if searching for some trivial task to give her. In Trottingham, there are more of us than there are of them. In Trottingham, I bet the Elder will be the one abandoning ship. The pony in my head whimpered, watching my actions ripple out into war and bloodshed. I'm so sorry. For what? Pout and Bitterbright asked. None of this is your fault or your doing, except that because of you and your friends, this squad isn't dead at Nova Ranger's hooves, or still trapped in that stable school waiting to die of thirst and starvation. He nickered. This battle started the moment Nova Ranger killed one of us and locked the others away. And that happened hours before any of you showed up. This is on her. And on us. 
Hell, we should be apologizing to you for not saying enough until after the others started slaughtering the poor pony folk in the Ministry Mare's stable. It's on me, Steelo said with finality. This has always been on me. As he plodded past me, he lowered his helmet and whispered into my ear. It's better that my child never knew me. Blackwing and her talons flew with us part of the way, delivering news of their victory back to God, along with the details of a five-year plan that the Overmare and Blackwing had sketched out upon my suggestion. Y'all sure we shouldn't stand there with you at Stable 29? No, Steel has told Calamity. This is an internal matter now. I listened to DJ Pony's broadcast in my ear bloom. But there had been no news of Stable 2 yet. Nothing that could forewarn the elders that their ranks were breaking. I prayed that the silence would last until I reached homage. It was another stroke of luck that Calamity Shack was only a little bit out of our ways towards Fetlock in Manhattan. It was, however, completely in the opposite direction of Splendid Valley. I began to worry what Red Eye might be doing if we delayed too long. I was hoping that his twisted generosity would extend to giving me time to rest after everything I had gone through. What would we do once we reached Ten Pony Tower? Zenith questioned. Will Red Eye even let you go there? Night Strawberry Lemonade asked, moving to a bench near me. Steelhoofs had managed to successfully maneuver behind several other Steel Rangers, preventing her from reaching him. I found the little dance amusing, partially because her voice was so cute, even more so coming from inside that fearsome armor, partially because it was finally some pony else's turn to feel a little uncomfortable. Red Eye has that place surrounded, I said, frowning. Shooting our way in would be a bad move, but we could try to sneak our way in. I recalled what Amwich said in her fake letter to me. Then, later we can meet where we met before, and I promise. Well, <laughs> no need to dwell on what she promised. The important part was, I know of a roof access that Red Eye's troops probably don't, and I believe Amwich is watching for us to land there. The others nodded. Zenith looked a little concerned. Will they even allow a zebra inside? Homage will, I assured her. Zenith may not get the run of the tower, but there was no way we were leaving her out in the cold. As we approached the turning point for Calamity's shack, Blackwing swooped close, flying alongside the Sky Bandit. The Griffin signaled me. Do you think Godina will be satisfied with the payment? I called out over the rush of the wind. Blackwing barked a laugh. I think she'll be surprised. Disturbed, maybe. She was hoping for rights to draw from Stable 2's water talisman. Instead, she's getting an offer to move the entire damn population of Stable 2, along with its most valuable assets, to her domain. As Velvet Remedy had determined, Stable 2 could not afford to remain isolated for much longer. The population needed to be genetically spread to introduce new breeding stock from outside. But they couldn't just open the stable door. Not with Stable 2 near the edge of the Everfree Forest and an hour's trot from Raider territory. They needed to move. Shattered Hoof provided additional population and safety. With this plan, the Water Talisman would be moved to Junction R7, and the entire subterranean apple orchard would be relocated to the mines underneath Shattered Hoof. The ponies of Stable 2 would start building homes in the land between Junction R7 and the Old Prison. It would be a massive undertaking, but then, Old Appaloosa had been built by Earth Ponies in a single year. It felt odd knowing that my new home was going to become my old home. Within five years, Junction R7 was going to be the center of a town. I'm more worried about the delay, I called out. It's going to be a few months at best before the ponies in Stable 2 can actually start to move. Right now, the area outside Stable 2 is just too dangerous. The Everfree Force exodus, however, was just a part of the problem. I was even more worried about retaliation from the Steel Rangers. So for now, the stable was sealing itself up again. The ponies of Stable 2 needed time to process and cope with the trauma. They needed time to clean the stable and rebuild their lives. They wouldn't be able to forget, and part of me thought that was good, as it would prevent them from losing sight of what they owed and the changes that needed to be made. God's patient, Blackwing commented. But you've got other problems. Only way to ferry the orchard to Shattered Hoof is by rail, and those tracks pass through New Appaloosa. Crap. That's right. We'll work something out, I assured her. But I've got to deal with Red Eye first. 
I sounded more confident than I felt. But Calamity's words have reminded me that while there might be questionable or even downright villainous ponies in the high places of New Appaloosa, the bulk of the townsfolk were good ponies. Hell, Ditsy Doo lived there. The thought of the ghoul Pegasus brought up another responsibility. I had to find a way to thank her. We all owed her our lives. Without those stealth bucks which she had given freely to aid Blackwing in saving the ponies of my home, I moved away from the edge of the Sky Bandit as Blackwing veered off, the other griffins following closely. Butcher blew a kiss in our direction. I think it was for steel hooves, but I had no idea why. Maybe just a camaraderie that comes with a mutual love of excessive firepower. Calamity winged us in the other direction. This won't take long, I assured steel hooves and the outcasts. That's one giant cloud of scary black smoke. Calamity commented as we approached his shack. The smoke from the Everfree Forest fires had tinted the air an angry salmon hue. Calamity's shack, nestled halfway up a rugged plateau, was slightly closer to New Appaloosa than it was the closest border of the Everfree Forest. But while it was nowhere near the fires, the prevailing winds were blowing the smoke for miles. I'd come accustomed to the strange, sickly quality of the air outside, but Scootaloo's pit bug message brought back memories. That first morning in the equestrian wasteland, how the sheer oddness of it struck me. This was altogether different. I could smell unnatural odors riding in the smoke. I could taste something pungently bittersweet with each breath. Should we be breathing this? I asked Velvet Remedy. I was reminded of the dangers of working in Paris Bright incinerator pits. Oh god. Did any pony know what nastiness the smoke of the Everfree Forest might carry with it? I suddenly envied the Steel Rangers outcasts or otherwise, for the rebreathers built in their armored suits. Probably not, Velvet Remedy said, doing absolutely nothing to assuage my fears. Ugh. The cliffs around the shack were precarious with no safe path. There are probably very few people alive. There are very, probably very few people alive. Probably a good, I don't know, good, maybe a good percentage of people who know what it's like. Who know what it's like. To be able to breathe, what it, what it's to be forced to be breathing tainted air, like that. Like this was also mentioned in Scootaloo's message how the air was. If you could see the air, it's bad. Like when I play Fallout games, you notice that. Like you could see the air is bad. You know the air is terrible. And it's been like that for 200 years, even. So you gotta imagine what that's gonna be, like, compared to these ponies. Man. Well, anyway, you can imagine. What's it gonna be like? Path to ascend and no outcropping to land the passenger wagon. It was, after all, a home for a pegasus. Calamity was forced to land at the base of the cliffs. After brief discussion, it was suggested that Calamity and I would go up alone. Oh no, Velvet Remedy put her hoof down. You did not bring us all the way here, Calamity, to your old home, only to not let me see it. Calamity nickered, looking apprehensive and a bit embarrassed. Come on now. Velvet purred. I showed you mine, now you show me yours. God, that sounded dirty. I tried dirty. very hard to think of other things. Oh. <laughs> Tell you what, I'll levitate myself up there while you two fly up. Can you do that, little pip? Levitate yourself that far, I mean. To be honest, I wasn't sure. Self-levitation had always been the hardest trick. I wanted to give it a try, but I didn't want to suffer the fall if I failed. Be you ready to catch me? I asked meekly. Calamity nodded, stretching out his wings confidently. Somewhere behind me, I heard Zenith ask some pony. Why do they not just make two trips? I looked up, pointing my horn towards the shack, and swallowed nervously. It was very high. My horn began to glow. Focusing, I enveloped my body with a magical field and pushed off from the ground. I had done this much before, 
but just as in the pit, my ascent had begun to slow rapidly. Right I under the rainbow dash's house. To pull myself upwards. I was still slowing. What? What? I concentrated, sweat beating on my forehead. Hold on, I have to say this. What happened to Rainbow Dash's house? Did it get incinerated? Or was it just torn to pieces and so it would be making a cloud wall? I, that's what I want to know. Has the cloud, has uh, Rainbow Dash's cloud house been destroyed? I have to know. Forehead running down my neck. An overglow flared around my horn, casting reflections off the cliff rocks. I stopped slowing. I was doing it. I was pulling myself through the air. I was pushing exhaustion. The effort was almost painful, but I was doing it. I was flying. I lay on the little strip of wood that amounted to Calamity's front porch, panting heavily. My legs didn't want to hold me up. Oh, they could if I asked, but they didn't want to. It was worth it, though. For just a little bit, I was actually flying. It had not been a graceful act of freedom as I was neither Pegasus nor a bird. It had been work, like a galloping uphill against the wind. But I had done it. And for a moment, all the horrors and pain of the last few days was forgotten in the rush and exertion. I wondered how long it would take Calamity to fly up here with the Velvet Remedy. Not long, my mind answered swiftly. In fact, I was surprised they weren't already here. I remembered that I still had a memory orb from one of the safes in the Philadelphia Ministry of Magic Vault the orb from the safe which had also held a cloak. Judging from Zenith's reaction, and recent Griffin-related experience, I deduced that it had been a zebra stealth cloak. I decided abruptly that I didn't want to spend the weight laying sweaty and wiped on Calamity's porch, so I floated out the memory orb and focused on it. Immediately, I knew it was a mistake, remembering that the orb had come from a ruined box and was likely damaged itself. But it was too late. My body exploded, every nerve being flayed as I was burned over and over without dying. I knew my real body must be screaming and thrashing, but the pain was too intense to even fear for my safety. In fact, falling from the cliffside and being dashed on the ground below would have been a mercy. A thousand white-hot knives sliced through my brain. An eye blink, or an eternity later, the pain stopped as abruptly as it had started. And I was no longer myself. I wasn't even a pony. This was a familiar strangeness, and I could feel the cloak draped about me, the hood over my mane and ears, as well as a saddle pouch and something strapped to my side. This was too familiar. I was invisible again, a fact all too easy to glean as I watched a stallion admiring himself in a mirror, a mirror which should have also reflected my host from this angle, but did not. My host was a zebra in a stealth cloak, possibly the same one as before. If you won't accept my offer, then you should at least consider availing yourself of the good fortune that I am willing to pose for your new publication," the stallion suggested as he preened himself. He was a regal, haughty white unicorn, quite handsome in his elder years. I am, after all, the best pony. Prince Blue Blood? Hardly, intoned an elegant voice which could only belong to rarity. If the stallion had noticed the slightly disparaging tone, he showed no indication of comprehending it. There is no place for grandstanding or glory hounds in the Ministry of Image. Our purpose here is to help the client shine all across Equestria, not ourselves. And our client is all of Equestria itself. We should remain invisible. With a politely sweet tone, she encouraged. Perhaps you should try the Ministry of Awesome. We were in an office, a rather nice one at that, with elegant curtains and golden trim on the wainscoting. It certainly lacked the humbleness I had come to expect from a Ministry of Image building, which told me this was no MI hub, but the Ministry's headquarters and Ministry Walk in Canterlot, the one place where even the Ministry of Image would have to maintain an image. That's easy for you to say, the stallion frowned. You are already in charge of one of the most important branches of Princess Luna's new government. You are already in position far beyond your wildest peasant dreams. Wow. I was quickly forming a rather strong dislike for this buck. Rarity's repast was controlled, calm, even charming. Humility was a lesson hard learned, in fact. It's called maturing, something which, sadly, you seem to have had little acquaintance with. 
This is some sort of revenge, isn't it? Amazingly, the Stein still hadn't bothered to glance at the beautiful mare he was talking to. If he was the subject of my host's surveillance, then the magical cloak seemed superfluous. A lady is not vengeful, Rarity informed him with a refined tone. But you're not a lady, the Stein replied thoughtlessly. You are a government official. I wanted to deck him. You are quite fortunate that I am a lady, Rarity responded, her voice lowering, and that I do not have a nearby cake. I had no idea what cake had to do with this conversation, but at least my host finally turned her attention to the gorgeous white unicorn. Again, she looked younger than I would have expected, and there was no gray in her hair. She really knows how to take good care of herself, I thought admiringly. I bet she dyes her mane. And I am a prince, the stallion informed her, finally deigning to turn his gaze away from himself and towards the mare he was addressing. Proposal? Really? Rarity rolled her eyes. I have long operated under the assumption that your lineage was a joke perpetrated by Princess Celestia on... She paused thoughtfully before concluding. Any pony who ever met you. Rarity's horn glowed. If you were to accept my proposal, then you would be a princess. The prince continued obliviously. Oh, God, it says fuck me in a three-way. This jerk actually proposed to Rarity? That's what he meant by accepting his offer? A proposal isn't an offer. It's a request. Rarity glanced around, then sighed. Yes, and you would gain a hoof in one of the most powerful ministries in Equestria. Or at least that would be what you seem to think. She looked askance. I cannot imagine any world where that would be worth it. The prince huffed. You speak as if I'm not sacrificing greatly myself in this arrangement. As your husband, I would almost certainly be expected to have relations with you. Unbelievable. I focused, trying to make my host run over and buck him through sheer force of will. Rarity stared silently. I am sure... Oh, God, who else is feeling what Pip is feeling right now? Who else is feeling it? Who else wants to deck this guy? Ugh. Or if I had hooves, buck him right in the face. God, that sounded dirty. God, I need to stop thinking like that. Anyway, let's get back into this bullshittery. Her eyes slowly narrowed. Her horn briefly glowed again. This conversation is over, Prince Bluebud. It's time for you to leave. If you have any further business, please address it to any pony other than me. Your presence causes me physical pain. I'm a prince, and a member in high standing in the courts of Cantalot. You would do well to... But I don't want to, Rarity interrupted. I don't like you. In fact, I find you quite horrid. I despise that my position requires me to acknowledge your existence, and, much worse, give you the occasional time of the day. But that time has come to a close. Goodbye. Prince Blueblood huffed, standing tall. You have no place to complain. It is I who should... Oh, I'm not complaining. Rarity's eyes narrowed dangerously. I'm whining. If I was complaining, it would suggest there is a higher authority to complain too. But there is not. I am the highest authority within this ministry. Observe. Rarity trotted to her desk and pushed a button with her hoof. Oh, guards... She turned to smile at the unicorn stallion as the double doors at the end of the room swung open and two guard ponies appeared. Prince Blueblood backpedaled, startled. Please escort the prince off the property. If he resists, arrest him. I love this. Rarity really knows how to deal with dumbasses. I love it. Dumbass dumbasses and douchebags. And one thing I don't like are douchebags. Unless you're Boz. Boz is the exception. He's my best friend. He could be a douchebag because he's my best friend. And that's that. So anyway, back to the story. I would have enjoyed the show had my host not backed away, heart beating slightly faster. She turned our head, and I felt my teeth biting down on the object strapped to her side. It was the hilt of a sheathed blade, and the zebra silently drew it. 
The guards yeah. did as the Ministry Mayor requested. Prince Blue Blood showed enough intelligence to not resist. I had hoped that once they were gone, my host would resheathe her blade, but the zebra clearly had other plans. We were alone in Rarity's office. No. Perhaps she couldn't see us. No. Unbelievable, she nickered, echoing my previous thought. No. The elder unicorn had her back to us, her head lowered as she focused on something on her desk. As no. We were closer. No. No. I tried to shout out a warning. The zebra turned her head aiming the blade for the back of Rarity's neck, right in the lush of her mane. I could feel my host tense for the strike. Rarity shifted slightly, her horn glowing as one of the gems on the front of her desk slid aside, revealing a secret lock that demanded her attention. Please no. I felt something shift in the zebra's saddle pouch. A new weight. Suddenly, frantically, my host backed up. I heard the detonation, felt a brutal pressure and a searing pain. Then nothing. My host fell, unmoving save for a twitching she could barely feel. It was as if her entire body had gone numb. Simply unbelievable, reiterated Rarity as she elegantly turned, staring at where we had collapsed invisibly on the floor. I heard more than felt the cloak being pulled off of my host, glowing in a blue magical field that mirrored the soft light tracing the spirals around Rarity's horn. The moment it was removed, both the cloak and my host became visible. Rarity paid us no attention, floating the cloak to her and flipping through the rough fabric until she found the gemstone clasp. There you are, my pretty, she said, telekinetically ripping the gemstone free, breaking the clasp in the process. Oh, don't you have some interesting magic, she said as she appraised the gem, tossing the rest of the cloak aside. Twy will love taking a closer look at you. I realized I was seeing the inception of stealth bucks. I recalled a message I had found in the recruitment center. Intelligence suggested that the zebras had developed invisibility spell fetishes, but this looks like something designed by the Ministry of Magic. In the pervading paranoia of late wartime Equestria, Sunbony had feared the worst, not knowing what Twilight Sparkle knew. But the zebras hadn't gotten this magic from us. We had gotten it from them. The long, wicked blade lay on the carpet where it had fallen, close, yet impossibly out of reach. My host tried to move towards it, but her body wouldn't respond. I slipped a stun grenade into your saddle pouch, Rarity informed us, moving the gemstone out of sight. I like to think I'm rather expert at manipulating cloth, even if I can't see it. The zebra shuffled closer to the blade. Really? Rarity said with a ladylike scoff. She floated the blade away, turning a disdainful gaze on us. A zebra assassin attempted to infiltrate my office and murder me while concealed under a cloak with an enchanted gemstone. She leaned closer. I'd explain how I got my cue to mark, but it wouldn't do you any good where you're going. Another cocoon of blue light wrapped around a headset on her desk and floated it over her head, gently sliding it into place around her ears and muzzle. She get her get it from chance. Although. I do have to wonder, were you trying to assassinate one of Nightmare Moon's cabinet? She asked, turning her tail to us as she slid open the hidden compartment in her desk. Or were you after this? Rarity cancered to face us. Floating in front of her was a powerful, dark tome bound in twisted black hide. The moment I saw the book, I knew it held so many secrets. So many things just it's waiting for me to unlock. Book. Oh god. If I could only look at the pages. The black magic book. Well, oh god. I, I can't remember we'll what it's called! Out, won't we? Rarity promised. She lifted a hoof to the headset, her expression instantly changing to one of barely bridled joy. Oh, Pinkie Pie. This is Rarity. I've got a present for you. She smiled. You love this one. I came to on a worn, musty cot in Calamity's shack. Of course it'd be Pinkie Pie. Velvet Remedy was laying on the floor, panting and soaked in sweat. Calamity himself stood... I was starting to realize how evil Pinkie Pie really is right now. I know she's my favorite pony, but right now she's seeming very, very evil. Like, it seems like she's... Ah, son of a bitch. I keep doing that. Sorry, it's my... My computer is like five feet away from me. You guys probably can't tell, but my camera zoomed in on me. 
is zoomed in on just me and my everything for uh, me is like five feet away and I'm just yeah you get the idea so anyway Pinkie Pie seeming very evil because I'm starting to think she's a she likes to torture people yeah yeah towering over me you can see my tattoo for a minute coming through the window over the workbench behind him what happened little pip where I blinked, looking around. What? You made it all the way up, Calamity asserted. I saw you do it. But we were most of the way up here when you screamed, thrashing like you were on fire, and flung yourself from the porch. I fell? My eyes went wide. I turned, looking around. The door to the shack was open. I blinked as the image of the black book swam in front of me. Much like having turned away after staring at a bright light and seeing the shape of the light dance before your eyes. But nothing in a visited memory had ever left such an imprint outside of the experience. I blinked, clearing my vision. I could see the porch where I had been laying. The memory orb was nowhere in sight. Don tootin' you fell, Calamity retorted. We had a hell of a time getting you up here, even after you went limp. Been word sick. What the hell happened? I... I looked towards the empty porch again. My instinct was to lie. But there wasn't a lie that wouldn't end up worrying my friends needlessly. I made a mistake. While I was waiting, I touched a memory orb. Only, it was damaged. You did what? Calamity snapped. On the porch? Little Pip, I barely caught you. I cringed back. Staring up at my Pegasus friend, my hooves pushing at the cloth on his cot as my back thumped softly against the wall. You know, it's hard enough flying while you're carrying one pony. I can't do it with two when the second one is bucking and screaming like she's been eaten from the inside out. Calamity lashed out. Unpleasant nightmares about parasprites washed through my mind. Oh god! It nearly brought us all down. Velvet Remedy had to use a magic to carry you. And I'll remind you that she ain't nearly as good at that spell as y'all are. I turned a nervous look to Velvet. She was so exhausted that she could barely return my gaze. I don't think after all she's been through last night that maybe she didn't deserve for you to make us all scared to death that you're dying from something in that smoke. Oh, goddess. The weight of what I'd thoughtlessly done to them crushed me down. I started to shake. The hurt from my shame and Calamity's righteous anger broke the floodgates. And suddenly, the emotional deluge of the last half week consumed me. The horrors of Philadelphia slavery, the pit, the threat to homage, the slaughtered stable too, my mother. I'm sorry, I yelled back, bursting into tears. I fucked up. It was horrible. I'm sorry. God dang it, little pip. Clemmy growled back angrily. Your curiosity is going to get you killed one of these days. And today, you nearly took all of us along with you. I'm sorry! Calamity snorted, glowering as I broke into sobs. Velvet Remedy trembled, huffing as she got to her feet, and moved closer to me, pulling herself onto the cot with a painful effort. <sighs> okay, Calamity insisted. Ground rules. From now on, you don't play with one of them things unless you're on the ground, out of combat, somewhere safe. And you have one of us watching over you. Having laid the law, Calamity allowed his expression to soften. His own utter exhaustion finally showed through his eyes. He gently wrapped me with one wing. Uh, I'm immediately imagining Calamity as a dad. Was he? I don't know. I don't fucking know. But hey, it's a good th view the thing of things. Like, people with that kind of, who use that kind of authority. Yet again, he was a captain. He was a captain. He did have authority at one point in time. So, that could explain the why he's like that. Which is only done when someone has given authority and has had it for a good time. Like being a father, or being an officer, or an NCO. Oh, in my sense, uh, I haven't had any experience in either. So, because I'm just, I'm E4 in the army, and I don't have that experience as a leader. And, um, though I have led before. And, because I was 
an in, NCO when I was in JRTC in high school. Um, I was an NCO at one time, and I was a leader. So I guess I do have a little experience, but just not that much. I'm just not that good at it. And anyway, let's get back to it. Two of them stayed with me until the tempest passed. Now buck up, little Pip. Calamity finally said, prodding me with his weight. You gonna have a look at that safe or not? I nodded. Although for the first time, I really didn't feel right about allowing my curiosity to be sated. I slid slowly from the cot and looked at the floor beneath it. It was, at most, an average lock. Even in my distress, I could open it easily, with or without tools. The safe clicked open. Amongst the saddlebags worth of decayed personal effects, one item sat gleaming and unblemished by time. A statuette of Rainbow Dash. Her pose was powerful, wings spread, and a huge grin was on her face. Go ahead, Calamity said softly. Take it. I know you collect those things. But don't you want it? I asked, surprised. I already got her cutie mark burned to my flanks. I figure she's already close enough to me. I nodded, then carefully reached out with my magic, experiencing a sudden surge as my magic touched the statuette. I was... better. I felt like I could be better than I had ever been before. Do anything. Nimbler, more graceful. But much more than that... Confident? I was, in a word, cooler. The inscription was what Rainbow Dash inscription had to be. Be awesome. <laughs> Calamity stepped out of his shack and awesome. into the oddly reddish-orange air. He was encased in the terrifying black carapace of his old Enclave armor. The tips of his four noses... Is that what being loyal is? He tested his... Rainbow Dash, is that what being loyal is to you? Being awesome? That's my... That's what that's I have to ask wings and the scorpion tail. Then he lowered his head and hoofed off the helmet. He looked back up, letting the smoky wind catch in his orange mane. He looked weird without his hat on. Forget it, he huffed with a stomp. I'm not going round like this. He turned and trotted back into the shack. I'd rather be shot. It took him less than a minute to shock the armor. Velvet Remini wrapped it in her magic, making sure to also collect his helmet from the porch. Well, at least take it with us. You may change your mind when you see whatever forces Red Eye has around Ten Pony Tower. Fine, he grumped. I've grabbed everything I want. Let's just go. I paused. Calamity. I know you were hoping to sell a bunch of those slavers weapons up at Ten Pony, but I really think we should give them to Ditsy Doo. You know, as a thank you for what she did for Stable 2. Velvet Remedy neighed. That would be a rather impersonal gift, little Pip. And possibly a painful one considering what the slavers have done to her. I frowned, wincing. Besides, do you really want to give new apples some more weapons right now? I had to admit that I did not. Instead, Velvet Remedy looked to Calamity. Do you know anything that Ditsy Doo likes? I agree with Little Pip. We do need to give her a gift, something to show our thanks for her help. Well, Calamity thought. She likes... muffins. Velvet looked shocked. Can ghouls even eat? Apparently they didn't have to, but they could. I smiled. Between Homage and Zenith, we had the best cooks in the equestrian wasteland. <laughs> I spent most of the ride trying not to think about anything that had happened recently. I knew that if I did, I'd start crying again. Of course it would be Muffins. Instead, I tried to focus on the discussion between the outcasts. Of course! Muffins! Why didn't I think of anything different? Ah, oh, God. Guys, I love this story. I love you guys. So you guys know, don't forget that. <laughs> but they delved into the internal Steel Ranger politics, and I felt my attention drifting. Night Strawberry Lemonade sat next to me, 
chiming into the older members' conversations at every opportunity. <laughs> Strawberry lemonade, I thought. Sounds delicious. I groaned, oh God. catching myself before my imagination went too far south. Of course! I needed homage. I looked over the side of the passenger wagon. Twilight was spreading across the wasteland as we approached Fetlock. Below, I spotted the mostly collapsed ruins of that first cottage, but the wandering merchant and his mechanical owl had moved on. As we approached Fetlock, I spotted the faint column of smoke rising up from the pony hole that led us to Stable 29. More were curled up from nearby drainage gates. There were no sounds of fighting. This is either very good, Steelhoofs commented, or very bad. As we drew closer, a steel ranger moved out of the shadows. There was a flash of light. I ducked, expecting impact. But it hadn't been a weapon. It was a flare. Thank Applejack. I thought I heard Steelhoofs mutter. It was good news. I let out a breath. It was about time the equestrian wasteland threw us a break. Our luck continued to hold as we glided through the night over the Manhattan ruins. As we approached the top of Ten Pony Tower, I could see the firelights from Red Eye's camps below, ringing the tower on the ground and lighting up the Celestia Line. They had taken the exterior of the Four Star Station. Griffins flew in patterns around the tower, but they flew low, looking for targets on the ground. I realized with a start that Red Eye didn't know about the Sky Bandit. He knew we had a Pegasus, so he could suspect we had faster transport. But he had to allow for the possibility that we were walking, and if that were true, we'd barely be making Manhattan now if we traveled here straight from Philadelphia. We had time. We had a problem. There was an alicorn perched on the roof of Ten Pony Tower. Her shield was down, all the better to spot incoming little pips. I could shoot her. The silenced zebra rifle would more than do the trick. But the moment she went down, every alicorn in the area would know. And there was a good chance Red Eye would too. The passenger wagon lurched hard. Ah, uh, horse apples. Clamity grunted as we began to sink out of the sky. The spark batteries were drained, and our poor Pegasus was too exhausted to handle a sudden change in weight. He nearly fainted from the strain. We began to plummet. Frantically, I concentrated on wrapping the Sky Bandit with my magic. If I could pull myself through the air, maybe I could slow or even reverse our fall. My horn flared brightly. The strain hit me like a shock, buckling my legs, reminding me that I hadn't slept in over a day. We were still falling. I pushed harder, grasping, my body trembling. A layer of overglow burst from my horn. Sparks started to shoot from its tip. The glow around the Sky Bandit became brilliant. It attracted the attention of the griffins below as we plummeted towards the patrol line. The griffin turned towards us, lifting her sniper rifle, and fired. Now, everyone knew we were here. But I couldn't focus on that. I was pouring everything I had into trying to slow our descent. A second overglow wrapped my horn. Beams of light shot out of it. We began to slow. Ah, oh, hell. Calamity moaned weakly, all but collapsed in the harness as the alicorn took off from the roof, diving towards us as she put up her shield. I screamed, somehow tapping into strength I didn't have. Be strong. Be unwavering. Be awesome. A third layer of overglow erupted from my horn. The sky bandit stopped abruptly hovering in the air. Then we began to ascend. The alicorn's eyes widened as she stopped her descent. Her glowing horn began to crackle with electricity as she began to cast a lightning bolt at us. The griffin shot again. This time the bull hit the wagon, leaving a small hole in the roof. The griffin began to reload and was engulfed in green flame. Pyrelight hooted happily and swooped back up after us. Velvet Remedy tossed her shield around the sky bandit. The first bolt of lightning struck it, and the shield imploded, but it kept us from being hit. Part of my mind realized that the shock from a strike would obliterate my concentration, and we would fall to our deaths. The alicorn was flying upwards, back towards the roof, keeping a safe distance between herself and us as her horn began to crackle again with electricity. Pyrelight landed next to Velvet Remedy, looking proud. Zenith had shattered another flask on the floor and was stomping on it. 
as a second bolt lashed out. The zebra grabbed my mane in her teeth and pulled me onto her back. The powerful electrical bolt hit the sky bandit, arcing all about the metal frame. Velvet let out a ladylike squeal and collapsed. Sorry, I have to stop real quick. Right now, Pyrolite, you're fucking badass. Pyrolite, you're a fucking badass. Because right now, you are more useful than dog meat from Fallout 4. Which, by the way, guys, I, th I think I mentioned this earlier, but I've been trying to play that more often since I've been listening to this series. This game is making me look more deep into the game. You know, looking to look more deeper in the details of the game, like... Look at dead body, Ekar, like, look at skeletons, you know, and notice what the, it's around them. Like, I remember one time, um, I was in a, ner in a, in a uh, retirement home, and I, I looked around, and I found a security gate with a guy in a wheelchair locked behind it. I'm assuming, assuming this is, like, some old man who got paranoid and locked himself in with a bunch of med kits. And that's what was in there anyway, so. <laughs> Pilot squawked and tumbled to the floor of the passenger wagon. Zenith and I remained unharmed, protected by her insulating potion. We continued to rise. There was nothing else we could do. The alicorn landed back on the edge of the roof. Motes of magic began to form a ring about her, forming into eldritch darts. From somewhere on the rooftop, a lashing beam of cosmic energy struck the alicorn, rippling the shield where it pushed through to strike the monster directly. The shield imploded as the alicorn was reduced to luminescent moon-colored ash. I floated the Sky Bandit onto the rooftop. Homage was waiting there for us, the alien weapon floating by her side. As soon as she saw me, she galloped into the passenger wagon and wrapped me in a big hug. Homage. I could smell her, feel her soft coat and the warmth of her body. My own body relaxed in her embrace, and once more, I began to cry. A zebra! Homage squealed happily. Zenith cringed back as Amage offered her hoof. She doesn't like being touched, I told the sexy gray unicorn. Amage lowered her hoof and nodded. Sexy and gray who unicorn. might you be? Zenith asked, prompting introductions. Inspiration hit me. Amage, would you allow... I paused. Could you ask DJ Pony if Zenith could spend some time at the MASEBS? Homage and Zenith both looked at me curiously. Please? I asked Homage. I, um, I'm sure it could be arranged, Homage said trustingly. I turned to my zebra friend. DJ Pony has cameras all over the equestrian wasteland. Maybe one of them has seen your daughter, or her tribe. The zebra's eyes widened. I saw a glimmer of hope. Homage smiled. I forgot yes, that Zenith has a daughter. Fuck. And I'm sure I can get DJ Pony to let you peek at some of the archived footage. I'll show you how to do so, then leave you in private. She blushed a little. Little Pip and I are going to be busy, but we won't be far away. She likes spankings and bondage, Velva told Homage in a conspiratorial, overly loud whisper. <laughs> I stared at her, wide-eyed and blushing hotly. That, that, that's not true. Homage raised an eyebrow. Did you two talk about liking bondage and spankings? She asked innocently. No. I mean, yes, but... Oh. Homage feigned understanding. So, you talked to Velvet about liking bondage. No, me, but... Ah, crap. So you do like it. Homage was grinning way too much. I gave up hanging my head and accepting the doom... <laughs> I love it when this story just gets pervy. I just love it. This is a story not meant for kids at all. No, this is rated R. Um, this is rated R for really fucking awesome. That's what it is. In this of the situation, I narrowed my eyes, whispering to the charcoal coated mare. Oh God! All those times I fantasized about you. That was before I learned you were evil. Don't worry, Homage said, wrapping a foreleg about me as she smiled, her eyes twinkling as she glanced to Velvet. Last time I learned you were multi-orgasmic. Tonight, I'm going to find out just how many you can have before you pass out. Oh my god! She nibbled one of my ears. Then, 
I'm going to find out if I can wake you up with one. So, some bondage might be required. I felt myself flooding with heat and embarrassment. I simultaneously wanted to both let her tie me up and do whatever she desired, and to run away and hide under a rock forever. I swayed, feeling faint and nearly fell over. Delicately, Amage maneuvered me towards the rooftop door. Question, some of my female audience, do you ever feel this way? Uh, please tell me. Do you ever feel this way with your significant other if you have one, had one? Or if you with or with people you'd wish to do this with? Any of you. Do you don't have to tell me, I'm just curious if any of you. Wow, Zenith said, standing with the others as we walked away, her exotic voice gaining a touch of melancholy. With all your teasing, I was beginning to feel sorry for the little one. Now I just feel jealous. Yes, Velvet Remini agreed, sounding a touch stunned. So do I. She turned to Calamity. No offense. Offense? Hell, I feel jealous. Fuck! Amage snickered, then turned to the others. Are you coming? I stopped, at first thinking- Oh god. They were watching the whole time? Were they watching the whole time? I thought they were whispering that to each other. Oh my god. They were doing this in front of them? Now I, I want to know what Zena's sexuality is like. Oh god. Thinking that she was inviting them to watch. That... I couldn't possibly... No, 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 no. But Amage had less cruel plans. Oh, I've arranged for the rest of you to have the same suite as before. It's all taken care of. Velvet Remedy and Calamity had taken their leave. Velvet mentioning something about dragging the poor Pegasus buck to the spa. Amage, Zenith, and I were left alone in the room with a huge alicorn water fountain. As physically exhausted, emotionally gutted, and achingly horny as I was, I couldn't seek attentions for my needs until the others had been met. First came getting Zenith set up in the emergency broadcast station. Zenith's eyes went even wider as she took in the walls of monitor screens. Many still flickered and suffered from distorted images, but I saw all of them were working. This is... amazing, the zebra breathed. What is this place? Amish told her, adding, The images you see here from the Spire Towers like the one in Philadelphia. Until just three days ago, the ones from Philadelphia were dark. Red Eye is using that tower for something and it was keeping me from getting a signal. But thanks to little Pip, DJ Pony now has eyes into the heart of slaver territory too. Amage gave Zenith a sympathetic and hopeful smile. We'll finally be able to start doing some real good out there. The zebra nodded. For the next hour... Amage instructed the zebra in the camera controls and accessing the archives. Zenith took it in with difficulty. In the meantime, I mostly just watched. In Amage's home, I finally felt safe. I was no longer on edge, no longer running or fighting, and my body kept trying to fall asleep. I did, however, manage to get a promise of muffins from both of them. Ditsy Do would soon be getting the biggest and best muffin delivery in the history of the equestrian wasteland. Then, finally, Amage and I were alone, together, in the foyer, standing next to the fountain. And what shall I do with you, my wasteland heroine? Amage purred. First, I mean. Amage, I said reluctantly. We need to talk. Oh my, sounds serious. I nodded. Falling to my haunches, I began to talk. I started with the truth about Steelhoofs and Chief Grimstar apologizing profusely for having not told her sooner. Amage's expression was troubled but forgiving. Then, I told her of Red Eye and the Mega Spell. We have to evacuate the tower, I said finally. Quickly and stealthily. We can't leave Tempony Tower, Amage said, shaking her head. I know they have you surrounded, but maybe with the Sky Bandit, or through the tunnels, I fretted. It can't be impossible. Amage shook her head again. Now, some of the population may be, but even then, I can't leave here. We can't let Red Eye take this place. 
Look, I know DJ Pony's important, but he's not as important as your life. She couldn't understand that, of course. But I had seen the gardens of Equestria. I knew. Then you seriously underestimate the need for a voice of truth and hope in this ruined world, Homage told me. DJ Pony gives the ponies of the Equestrian Wasteland the warnings and advice they need to survive. But more than that, he gives them comfort and the hope they need to make surviving worthwhile. I looked away and nodded, feeling ashamed. She was right. And while I would say that DJ Pony is the most vital thing we need to preserve and protect here, he is not the only treasure in this tower. I looked up in surprise. This was new. Homage brushed my hair tenderly, even as her own blue mane fell into her eyes. Little Pip, love, she said. The words shooting thrills through me, igniting desires and dreams. Tempony Tower was a prominent hub of the Ministry of Arcane Sciences. It's not a hotel, or a mall. There are secrets here. Secrets? I asked, that damnably curious pony in my head perking at the mere idea. What sort of secrets? I could tell Amage was debating whether or not to tell me, but only for a moment. Little Pip, did you ever wonder how I could stay here, DJ Pony's public assistant, when the stuffy lot in this place despises him so? I had to admit, the question had never occurred to me. There is a secret society within Tempony Tower. They are the ones, I dare say, who are really in charge. She backed up and looked around. There are places in this building that are sealed off from the general public. Places where the Ministry secrets played out. All manner of magical research and development. She looked at me, tossing her hair out of her eyes. You know that annoying shield spell the Alicorns all have? It was developed here. I found myself looking up at the age-darkened bronze statue. The Alicorn in the room. And you haven't seen how powerful that spell can get if you pump enough power into it. Homage told me. The only reason the Alicorn shields can be punched through with the right firepower is because they can't manifest it at anywhere near full power. Actually, I said, remembering the supercharged Alicorn from Philadelphia Crater flying through the building, her shield tearing apart walls and supports. I think I have. I want you baby to tell her about it. Once I was done, she nodded, visibly shaken. I think you're right, she admitted. Amish continued. In the weeks before the end, one of the other hubs in the Ministry of Arcane Science cracked some sort of sub-spell that they used to enhance the shield spell, she continued. And not make it more powerful, but make it so that specially designated ponies could pass through a shield as if it wasn't there. They started creating enchanted shield generators, placing them inside rooms or sections of buildings they wanted secure. With that, Amish hopped up onto the fountain's rim and tapped her right forehead rhythmically on the alicorn statue. I gasped as the horn flared with magic, and the glowing aura of a magical shield swept over the walls. The M.A.S.E.B.S. and Twilight's Athenium are amongst Tempony Tower sealed areas, she said with a smile. To the population below, DJ Pony has always been a strange hermit living in part of the tower that no pony can get to, always dealing with the outside world through intermediaries. My jaw dropped. Once started, the only way to turn the shield off was from inside, and the only ponies you could get inside were those designated by the subspell. Bypass spells, I said, slowly reclosing my jaw. Amish gave me a quizzical look. The subspell, it's called a bypass. Twilight Sparkle reverse engineered it from a zebra enchantment. Like the self bucks, I thought. Shield screens that let specific materials through my flank. Damn it. I was going to have to kill the goddess for Red Eye after all. Not only as a way to protect homage and the ponies of Ten Pony Tower, it was the only way to keep him from taking too close a look at this place. Could we move all the ponies of the tower into the shielded areas? Eh, uh, not for long, homage answered. And I don't think it would do that much good. If that Balefire bomb goes off... It'll take out the foundation and everything that's not protected. All the shielding in Equestria won't save us from that fall. Glumly, she added. The shields that were used to protect the whole building haven't worked since the first one. I know, I told her, recounting how a wrong turn in the basement had brought me to the room full of generators. 
I didn't mention the maintenance pony who had died from shrapnel when the mega spell overloaded them and they all imploded. Another realization struck me. Red Eye is researching a way to trick a bypass, I warned her. If these shields were being used to house the most vital research of at least one of the ministries, what could he be after? Was it here? He hasn't had much success yet, but he's got ponies working on it. Amage frowned. Not good. She hopped down from the fountain. Thank you for the warning, little Pip. She approached me. Problem is, there already is a way to trick a, uh, bypass, right? I nodded. The bypass works on genetics, and it's not as accurate as the Ministry of Arcane Sciences thought. Close family members of the designated ponies, or even a direct descendant of them, can get through a bypass. That's how I can get in here, even if the shields are up. Amwaj looked back at the alicorn, and then to me. Uh, the shields in Tempony Tower were set to only allow Twilight Sparkle and the three highest ranking unicorns in the Manhattan MAS hub to pass through. Turns out, I'm a direct descendant of one of those high ranking unicorns, she revealed to me. Just like the ponies who actually control Tempony Tower, that's why they want me here, Amwaj added cautiously. As long as I don't make too many waves. Oh. Oh, wow. I'll admit, I've been talking you up a lot. And I think I'm finally getting the others to come around. It won't be long before I can put the special resources of this tower at our hooves. Armand smiled sweetly. Let me give you the extended tour. Shield spells had only been the start. Amage guided me through one concealed hallway and shielded chamber after another, turning off the shields for me and restoring them in our wake. We walked into a large, multi-cornered ritual chamber, bleached brightest white. The floor was an intricate mosaic of white-on-white -white tiles in exquisite and arcane patterns. There was a mirrored chimney leading up to a skylight, looking up into the darkness of the clouds above. What is this? This, Amage revealed, is a megaspell chamber... I stumbled. Wait, you can cast mega spells here? Amage giggled. Yes and no. You can cast a specific mega spell in here. If you had enough unicorns who all knew the spell, each mega spell chamber is keyed to a specific spell, apparently. I nodded, my mouth suddenly dry. How many mega spell chambers does Tempony Tower have? Just this one. Homage admitted sadly. And it's useless. Useless? Wait. Homage moved over to one of the chamber's 32 corners. She floated up an audio machine. Oh, I found this in the recording studio. Apparently it never got around to editing. Homage started the machine, and hauntingly peaceful music flowed out, plucked and strummed from a deep-sounding harp. I closed my eyes and found myself swaying to the music. It was mysterious, unlike anything I had heard before. I try to pull this one out once a year for a late night broadcast. I love it, but it's totally not DJ Pony. I nodded, wanting her to shut up. I was enjoying the music. It was speaking to me, touching on the sorrows of the last week, but without making me hurt. The music ended in a rippling wave of sound that slowly reverberated away. I heard a voice from the recording. Sounded like some pony was speaking through the recording studio's intercom. That was beautiful Lyra. Next, let's try. But an argument in the background, at first almost too quiet to hear, was quickly growing louder. From inside the recording chamber, the voice of a mare who I assumed was Lyra spoke up. Um, what's going on? Um, you didn't hear this from me, but Twilight Sparkle's gone the last three days without sleep trying to prepare for the princess's inspection, and has been in supreme bitchy mode all day long. I suggest steering clear. Don't worry, I don't think she'll come in here. The arguing voices outside the recording studio were getting loud enough and close enough to make out the words. Well, that's just great, Twilight. Now she's in the bathroom sobbing her eyes out. Well, I'm sorry, but those results are just unacceptable. I can't go to the princess and tell her we've put her name on a mega spell that's... that's useless. The ponies in the recording studio had completely fallen silent. The argument was just outside their door. Twilight sparkled in a male voice that sounded vaguely familiar. 
there's better ways of handling it than grabbing a pony, pointing and saying, look, there are all the thousands and thousands of bodies of ponies who are dead because your spell sucks. Explain it to them. Just how the hell is that supposed to help? Don't you get it, Spike? The zebras have mega spell tipped missiles. Hundreds of them. If they launch them, those missiles will reach Equestria from the zebra homeland within minutes. And this Celestia Wanner, Celestia Prime, or whatever they're calling it, can't even be cast unless it's sunny. I can't tell the princess that the only defenses we have against those missiles can be defeated by a cloudy day. What if the zebras decide to attack us at night? You know what? Forget it, Twilight. I'm going to take a nap. And frankly, you should too. You're always taking a nap. There's work to be done. Whatever. Wake me when the Twilight I know and love has decided to visit. Until then, I don't even want to speak to you. Ugh, fine. In here, Homage said, waving a hoof. Hold on. Hold on. This was, I bet this right now was right before the Mega Spell hit. Hmm? That's what I th I'm guessing. That, that happened right before the Mega Spell hit. And that right there is why, oh god. Oh. oh. This is like tripping me the fuck out. We're, we're over uh, two-thirds of the story, two-thirds of the chapter done, guys. Holy shit. Off at a sprawling agricultural bay. We discovered that the Ministry of Arcane Sciences had perfected spells that purified water, cleaned radiation, and even purged taint. I boggled. If only the maddened ghoul doctor had known what he killed so many to accomplish. Unfortunately, Amage informed me, these spells only work in an extremely small scale. With a lot of effort, we could purge one tree, the fruit becoming ripe and succulent and perfect for consumption. But there's nothing to keep the poisons from just seeping back in, and the area we'd affect is so small that it would take an army of unicorns to clean enough of our field to grow a garden without having to worry about the soil going bad before the harvest. But it makes for wonderful potted plants. But if you could cast it everywhere all at once, purge everything, I realized what I was seeing. These were the components of the Gardens of Equestria. Now I'd say you were delusional, but I'm talking to my little Pip. Now I know better. It was time to tell her. When I was done, Amish collapsed weakly. Me? She looked at me, as if pleading for me to renounce the truth. The salvation of all the Equestria is on me? I nodded. You, Ditsy Doo, four others. We don't know who yet. This spell. It will fix everything? Um, pretty much. I nodded. Are you telling me that they're gonna start a new Elements of Harmony? She's one of them. She is one of them. And there are four others who we don't know yet. So that means we're gonna go into the story finding four other people trying to fix all of Equestria? Mother of God. The Spikes end up being one of them. I'm gonna be ha that'd be kinda awesome. But seriously! Which wouldn't make sense if he's not a pony. But hey, nothing stops it. Be done first. I'm not the Wasteland Savior, homage. You are. You and them. I gave her a bittersweet smile. I'm just the one that clears the way. Amma stared at me for a long time, then pushed herself up. Oh, I need a drink. Screw my mother, and screw my vulnerability to addictions. We were back at the Athenium, and Amma was drowning herself in apple whiskey, and I was right there beside her, soused to the... whatever is that ponies get soused to. And then, Amage slurred, continuing a tale that had blurred into another tale, which had jumped off from the original story about four stories back. Joke Blue says, Pfft, big deal. You've got one box that's bigger inside than outside. Well, Mr. Hooves, well, I've got four little saddlebags, and I can carry about 30 rifles in them, and more ammo than you can shake a hoof at. Hell, you should see how many rakes I can cram into my toolbox back home. 
Amage thumped down the apple whiskey bottle on the table for emphasis. I paused, waving my hooves as I tried to measure my imagination. I was drunk and probably missing something, because there was no way a rake could fit in a toolbox. I finally gave up, deciding it must be a joke. Joke Blue's a funny name. How'd you get that? Homage became more somber, although no more sober. Birth defect. Her mother was hit by killing joke while pregnant. Lucky either of them survived. Oh, I said, not killing really understanding, joke? but reaching out a comforting hoof anyway. It seemed the right thing to do, even though I ended up knocking over several of the killing apple joke. Bottles. Fortunately, most of them were empty. I'm guessing that's a mega spell version of a poison joke. I I'm going to say that right now. So that's kind of something new. I want to. I don't want to pass that up. I got to remember that. That might be important later. I, I don't know why. I may be wrong. I may be right. Don't know. Let's get going. A memory struck me, and I began to cry again. Lit, pip, uh, what is it? With a shuddering breath, I recounted. I shot one of the Steel Rangers in the back of the head. I think it was the one that killed my old mentor, but I'm not sure. Well, sounds like the bitch deserved it. Sounds like all the Steel Rangers did. Yeah, I know, but I just, I just snuck up and shot her. And kept shooting. Even after she was dead. Until I'd emptied little Macintosh into her corpse. My breast heaved with a shudder. I... I don't like the pony I'm becoming. I think I'm losing myself. My voice hitched. Monterey Jack was right. I'm running out of me to save. Amage was by my side. I didn't remember her leaving her chair. For the second time that night, she held me as I began to cry. She gently led me towards her bed. Come here, little pip. Just rest for now. If Red Eye had any problem with me staying at Ten Pony Tower, he did nothing to show it. Even the loss of the Alicorn and Griffin seemed to go unnoticed. I knew that should worry me. Instead, I ignored it. Instead, I relaxed. I even went to the spa with homage. Twice. I didn't want to think of myself as a selfish pony, but fuck Red Eye. I needed this. And hadn't I earned at least a little of it? Maybe not, considering my mistakes. The damaged memory orb. That really stupid battle plan going behind the wall alone. But if I didn't, then my companion certainly did. I had hoped that Zenith and Amage would get along, but while Amage seemed to like the zebra, Zenith maintained a thankful but remote demeanor, even a touch frosty. It made the muffin baking sessions in the kitchen awkward enough that I spent that time in the library, sitting at the table, researching and reading. I had just finished a comparative reading of the library's unabridged version of applied gemstones with my own and was staring up at the huge painting of Splendid Valley when Zenith trotted in. Any luck trying to find your daughter? I asked, trying to sound casual as I reminded her what an exceptional and unique tool Amage had put at the zebra's disposal. Yes and no, Zenith replied. I have seen signs of her tribe. They have been living in the foothills beneath the Cantalot ruins, she quickly added, safely outside the cloud, but I have seen no sign of my daughter. Still, I thank you for this. You should be thanking Amage. I have. Then, why do you act so... cold around her? The zebra contemplated me, judged me, then finally said, Did you not see the weapon she used? Your lover has been touched by the stars. She is cursed. No good can come of her. Zenith walked out. Well, fuck. It would seem that even now there was no reasoning with a zebra when it came to that nonsense. I was probably lucky I didn't step in any star spawn blood, or she might think I was cursed too. There's no such thing as curses, I called out after her in frustration. With a deep sigh, I buried my head in the scattering of books. A few minutes later, Amish strode in, a puff of muffin batter on her nose. Now then, she whispered huskily as she wrapped her forelegs around me. I flushed, feeling a pleasant, uncomfortable fluttering wash over my body like I'd fallen into a bed of butterflies. Where was I? 
that fluttering coalesced to my nether regions, becoming a very warm and joyful difficulty to bear. Twenty-three, wasn't it? What? Oh my goddesses. She was actually counting. The sky bandit cut through the air as we approached Splendid Valley. The sky was crisp and slightly... I'm kind of glad they don't describe the scenes in between those. Stained with smoke. The valley below was a rocky wasteland completely barren of life. Scattered small holes were the only warnings that the caves beneath were home to dozens, if not hundreds, of the most dangerous monsters in all of Equestria. Hellhounds. I floated out my binoculars and stared towards the horizon. A sinkhole several miles across indicated where the Balefire bomb had been detonated. The bomb had been snuck in underground and detonated. The surface above had collapsed into the toxin-filled tunnels below. Over the last 200 years, the sinkhole had weathered and eroded into a wide crater. It glowed faintly, even in the daylight. It was marked with hundreds of holes. On the cusp of the crater, I saw the crumbling walls of the Merry Pony. Once a station for gem mining, the building had more in common with Shatterduff than any of the ministry hubs that I had seen. It could have passed for a fortress, but a devastated one. The explosion and sinkhole had torn away part of the foundation and crumbled the rest. About a third of the building had collapsed into the crater. The rest had suffered a mega-quake. Whoa, Nelly. If the goddess doesn't survive that, I reckon she probably earned 200 years of living. What is the plan, little one? Plan? Velvet Remedy chuckled. I think Little Pip's just planning to go in there and shoot her. My friends had all spent the last couple days in much-needed recovery, as had I. Despite the mounting hopelessness of our mission, everyone was well-rested and back in form. If I was going to fail and die, I was happy it would be like this, with these ponies. No, wait. Zebras weren't ponies. With these people. Well, then it's a darn good thing I sold all those guns and bought us plenty of ammo. Even managed to get some enchanted ones for little Macintosh. Don't know if they're enchanted with a guy to slay him, but we can hope. I checked my pit buck and brought up my eyes forward sparkle. I checked the date and time. Dizzy Deuce should have her muffins by now. I smiled to Zenith. Thanks for your help with that. I'm sure she'll love them. It struck me that when Zenith and I had walked across the moat and outside the wall, I had been in the equestrian wasteland for over five weeks. Now it was nearly six. Six weeks from apprentice pit buck technician to would-be deity slayer. My life is surreal. Velvet Remini leaned close. So, how high did you get to? I blushed hotly and buried my face in my forearms. Look sharp. Calamity called out. Income at high eight. My head shot up. I pulled up my- What a question to ask in the situation you were in! My binoculars again. Five glowing orbs, alicorn shields, were heading towards us from Maripony. Damn it. I should have worn that damn Enclave gear after all. Calamity cursed. Little Pip, reassemble Spitfire's Thunder. We're in for a bumpy ride. I levitated the magically augmented anti-machine rifle from Calamity's holster and began putting it together. Four midnight blue alicorns suddenly appeared, flanking us. The stars cursed me to a thousand rapes by the horn of Nightmare Moon, Zenith whispered next to me, shocking me nearly as much as the alicorn's arrival. You've been around Little Pip for too long, Velvet suggested, floating out her shotgun. Wow. The alicorns were already casting their shields. Welcome to the home of the goddess. The voice boomed in my head, reverberating with its own echoes. Oh, Velvet moaned, wavering. This is not good. Put away your puny weapons and come. You are my guests, for I, the goddess, have nothing to fear from you. Oh, no. No, 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 no. If she ain't got nothing to fear from us, why the show? Hell. Why not just send us packing? Zenith looked between the three of us. What are you speaking of? But I knew. Oh, by the goddesses. The real ones. I knew. Heavily, I said. 
because she wants us to do something for her. We were guided into the crumbling building. As we landed, we saw at least three dozen more alicorns standing about the crumbling ruins. In a single movement, in perfect unity, they all turned their heads to look at us. It was the unparalleled creepiest thing in the history of ever. <laughs> Escorted through the doors by the four midnight blue alicorns, they dropped their shields. Honestly, they didn't need them. We were totally outmatched. I was surprised when the alicorns had brought us to what looked like a security substation within the building. This room seemed largely undamaged, save by time. The rest of the rooms and hallways we had seen were broken and crumbling, fragmented by the subterranean blast and eroded by centuries in weather. This small room seemed almost... intact. There was no goddess here. There was nothing but some chairs, a bank of four dusty monitors and a microphone, a filing cabinet, and a few ridiculously pristine coffee cups. The area above the monitors was glass, but the long window looked out at nothing but a metal wall inches away. The opposite wall had a recessed door. There were odd grooves on the wall. I reckon this is our cell, Calamity said. If so, it would be stifling, and cramped if any of the alicorns tried to stay in here with us. We will talk, but first the goddess wishes you to see to understand and marvel. The voice of the goddess didn't merely reverberate, I realized. It was preverberated. Like there were dozens of smaller, weaker voices inside that voice, all trying to say the same thing at the same time, and not quite succeeding. The voice of the goddess was a chorus. Understand what? Velvet Remedy asked. Zenith looked at her, confused. The goddess. The security monitors flickered to life under the dust. One of them displayed colorful ponies and lab coats, milling about a much bigger version of this room, full of monitors and mainframes and banks of blinking lights. Ready when you are, a chartreuse pony with a cutie mark of a flask filled with bubbling green liquid said, glancing up at us through the monitor. These are images of the far past, Zenith intoned. The second monitor looked down on the vast factory floor. The factory was filled with six huge interconnected vats full of churning luminescent stews that rippled with lavender and green beneath glass coverings, the light casting colored shadows over everything. Arcane apparatus hung down from the ceiling. Catwalks ringed the vats, and another hung suspended from the ceiling above and between them, stopping midway across the room with some manner of control panel at the end. Again with the catwalks of her factory floor's aesthetic of wartime equestria, I groused. Is that? Velvet Remedy began to ask as a single pony appeared on the third monitor. An elderly lavender pony with gray shrieking her purple mane. The room behind her was about the size of this one, filled with identical monitoring equipment. But where we saw only a metal wall, her picture window looked out into the factory floor and monitor too. Twilight Sparkle, I nodded. Uh, you got us, Niss, Calamity said to the air, tapping on the last monitor. I hope you're aware that this one is broken. The monitor had a large crack running through it and was displaying only rainbow splotches. Broken? What? Of course I am. The goddess knows all. The little sub-voices continued to telepathically echo the last two words for several seconds after the goddess had spoken. Lovely, Velvet Remedy said snidely. Ready to begin pony testing, Twilight Sparkle said, sounding just a hint nervous. Send her in. Sending in test subject one, the pony on the monitor one announced. Don't call her that, Twilight warned. She trotted over to look out the window, floating a coffee cup filled with what looked like tea to her lips, sipping primly. She set the cup aside and leaned her muzzle over a microphone. On monitor two, a lovely blue unicorn with a mane that had aged to a luxurious silver slowly made her way out to the suspended catwalk. She turned and looked up to the window. Twilight Sparkle, I just wanted to thank you again for giving me this opportunity. It means so much to me. You're welcome, Trixie, Twilight Sparkle said kindly. Trixie? The name rang a bell, but it took a moment to place it. Trixie, the mare from the cottage outside Fetlock. 
She went to Manhattan for a meeting with Twilight Sparkle and never returned. The lavender pony hit a button with her hoof, and an ornate golden cup rose out of the console at the end of the walkway. Purple and green liquid rose through the tubes running from the vat to the apparatus above. Then, a thin stream poured into the cup. Trixie walked across the platform and sniffed at the cup. Is that roses? Twilight chuckled softly. Yes, I added the scent. Hopefully it'll taste like roses, too. Really? Trixie looked up towards Twilight Sparkle with astonishment. Twilight's ears drooped. Unfortunately, probably not. She hesitated. Trixie, you know you don't have to do this, right? Oh, I want to, the blue unicorn insisted. I want to help, and this will make me more powerful, like Luna and Celestia. Is this the start of Unity? Well, not that powerful, but more powerful, yes. Or is the goddess I Trixie? Twilight Sparkle looked uncomfortable. We're hoping for more than that. And it's safe, right? Absolutely. Twilight Sparkle assured Not. the blue unicorn on the catwalk below her. All the tests have come back looking spectacular. The only variable is, well, dosage. And for that, we needed to do some testing with pony volunteers like you. With luck, we'll get it right the first time. If you're the goddess, I swear to fucking god! The unicorn at the end of the catwalk nodded, and mumbled something that sounded like great and powerful smells like roses, then looked up with wide eyes. You sure I shouldn't start with just a little more, then? Twilight Sparkle stifled a chuckle. No, I... On the monitors above, everything happened at once. From the broken one, I could hear a terrible roar, and the rainbow sprays turned into a flaring light. On the other three, the world shook. On the first, chunks of ceiling came down, some killing ponies outright, one blocking the door. A mainframe toppled in a spray of sparks. On monitor two, the entire factory floor shook. I could hear loud twangs as several of the cables holding the suspended platform snapped out of the ceiling. Sections of the catwalk fell. Two of the vats were ruptured as a third of the ceiling came down, spilling their glowing contents onto the factory floor. I could see automatic systems severing and sealing the connections with the other vats. Trixie cried out as half the cables holding up her section of the catwalk gave way, turning it into a freely swinging platform. On the third monitor, alarms were blaring. Radiation surge detected. Seismic activity detected. Toxic contamination warning. Safe room sealing. No! shouted Twilight Sparkle as a huge armored plate slid down over the door to her room. She turned to the window as a massive armored shutter swung down from above. Trixie! On monitor two, Trixie's platform tipped, swinging in a low arc. The unicorn slid down the inclined surface, trying to find purchase as the lower end of the catwalk segment impacted the glass roof of one of the vats, shattering it. The blue unicorn plunged into the vat. All of the monitors flickered and went dead. The four of us stood in the security room, shaken, our eyes peeling away from the monitors to look at each other. Monitor 3 flickered back on. Dear Any Pony, this is the mayor of the Ministry of Magic, Twilight Sparkle. A weakened Twilight said. It's been two days now since the mega spell struck on Mare Pony. I can only imagine by the lack of rescue that this was not an isolated strike. I'm leaving this record in case some pony else does come. I'm trapped in safe room 3 on Mare Pony Vats level. The elder lavender pony addressed the camera. The safeguards that should allow me to open it aren't working, and unfortunately for me, I designed these rooms to withstand a nearby mega spell strike, so the room is more than a match for my own magic. Calamity, Velvet Remedy, Zenith, and I all watched the monitor, realizing we were watching Twilight Sparkle's goodbye letter. My vision began to blur wetly. I tried to force myself not to cry. I'd cried too much this week already, but the tears rolled down my cheeks anyway. I'm out of food, and the safe room's water talisman seems to have been corrupted. She gave a wry smile as she said, At least I'm fairly confident that pure water isn't supposed to be that color. I'm also beginning to suffer hallucinations. 
I think that I'm hearing the screams of the ponies in Maripony, like something horrible is happening to them. I know that's impossible. These walls are soundproof. I keep hearing Trixie's voice in my head, screaming. Sometimes it gets so bad. The Lavender Pony waved it off. Not important. What is important is that we tried. We tried, and we came so very close. Another week, maybe even just a few more days, and the work we did here would not only have changed the war. I believe we could have forced a peaceful resolution. What's important now is that we still have one more chance. Find Spike. He's my most loyal assistant, my number one assistant. Find him. Twilight Sparkle seemed to sleep. The monitor flickered out again. Spike. The monitor burst back to life. Twilight Sparkle's haggard face was pressed close to the camera. She looked atrophied. Crazy. Something's going on here. I... I don't know what, but it's bad. If you're a Maripony, get out. Get out while you can and drop a Zebra missile on this place. Suddenly, there was a loud metallic grinding from the speaker below monitor too. On the monitor, we watched as the metal plate over the door lifted up. The metal shutters over the windows lifted. Monitor 2 sprang to life. The vat room was in disaster. The floor was waist thick in mixed fluids. Something swam in the water. No, not swam. The body of a light red unicorn pony was being dragged through the liquid by a telekinetic tendril. We watched as the tendril hauled the body out of the pool and up the side of one of the vats. A moment later, the body disappeared over the lip and into the vat. Streaks of blood rose up several of the vats. On monitor three, Twilight Sparkle was crawling towards the door, too weak from hunger and dehydration to stand. Unable to stand, she couldn't see what was just outside her window. Light flared in the room, a blue light that took the form of Trixie. The blue unicorn stood, shimmering, in front of Twilight Sparkle. From this angle, we could clearly make out her face as she spoke to the Lavender Unicorn who once bore the element of magic. The Trixie illusion spoke, but no words came out. I'm so sorry, Trixie, Twilight Sparkle whimpered. As the Trixie illusion's mouth continued to move, the Zenith pushed past me and leaned close. Our zebra began to read the movements of the Unicorn's mouth. To be sorry for, your experiment worked after all. It worked more wonderfully than we ever dreamed it would. Don't be sorry. Be happy. We're going to live forever, you and I. I felt a deep, dark chill and prayed that Zenith had mistranslated that. What? Asked a startled Twilight. I'm sorry it took so long for me to be strong enough to save you, Twilight Sparkle. Velvet Remedy gasped as the light blue tendrils of telekinetic energy snaked into the room and wrapped around each of Twilight's hooves. No! Twilight Sparkle struggled with more strength than should have been possible. It is time to save you now, Twilight Sparkle. Zenith continued to speak for illusion, Trixie. We're going to be close now, you and I. Oh, goddesses! Velvet moaned and buried her face in Calamity's mane as the tendrils slowly dragged Twilight Sparkle, kicking and screaming towards one of the vats. I was shaking. I wanted, so desperately wanted, to turn away. But I couldn't. Twilight Sparkle let out the last cry as she was dragged over the lip of the farthest vat. One word. A name, I think. But I couldn't make out what it was. The two monitors went blank. And this time, they stayed that way. Oh goddesses, oh goddesses, oh goddesses. I felt utterly numb with horror. Velvet Remedy was crying. Calamity... Well, he looked grimmer than ever. The whole room shook, the air filling with the squeal of grinding metal as the shutters over our own window lifted up. We stared out over the vats. This wasn't just a similar room. It was the same room. Sentries had not been kind to the room beyond. Another third of the ceiling had collapsed, as had two of the vats. The pool on the floor had turned to sludge, covered with a sickly layer of dust and floating debris. Swirls of colored light seeped up from the two still intact vats. They danced in the air, exploding like fireworks. In my head, 
I heard the echoes of half-remembered fanfare, but not from a memory of my own. The great and powerful goddess welcomes you. Okay, how in tarnation do we kill that? Calamity. You're telling me that the goddess is Trixie! Of all people! I know Trixie's a good guy now, but... Technically, a, not an antagonist. She's still a friend. She even helped save Equestria. But in this sense, she is the goddess? And not just that, she probably fused with Twilight somehow. That's my guess. Or she turned Twilight into a, uh, a Unity Alicorn. Or uh, the mu Super Mutant, I guess. I, that's my assumption of what happened. That means Twilight got a fate worse than death. Fuck! I hissed. More swirls of light lifted from the vats. They shimmered, merging together, until the giant face of Trixie loomed above us. But not just Trixie, as little moats of other ponies' faces occasionally burst to the surface, like zits, crawling along the head and mane of Trixie before sinking back. Fear not, for I, the goddess, already know why you have come. Red Eye, that treacherous pony, desires my end. But the goddess is not worried, for the goddess is great and powerful, and Red Eye is not. Somehow, through the sheer soul-breaking horror of what I was seeing and what I had just witnessed, the little pony in my head stopped for me to pay attention. She did not like where this was heading. Fear not, Zenith began, for I the goddess already. You can stop that now, Velvet Remedy hissed. Yet. I squeaked, then fought to find my voice. Red Eye has seen these recordings, hasn't he? It matters not that he has seen them. That would be a yes. It matters that he has disobeyed me and plotted against me. It matters that he has been withholding from me. Red Eye has not sent me a unicorn in over a year, and the goddess believes he will soon stand in the way of my unity altogether. And let me guess, I prodded. You need us to kill Red Eye for you. Please let it not be something as stupid as that. There wouldn't be enough face-offs in the world. The illusionary fireworks changed. A spinning pinwheel of crimson flame swirled behind the floating glower of the goddess, over-signaling her displeasure. Ugh, Velvet Remedy whispered, cringing back. Even for a real goddess, this would be a bit much, she neighed. Honestly, if we must have an eldritch nightmare of arcane science goddess, does she have to be a freaky carnival sideshow goddess too? Do not be absurd. The goddess can slay him at any time I choose, but... It even talks like Trixie! It even talks like Trixie! It's pissing me off! The goddess's presence is fucking pissing me off. I wanna cry. This is why it's making me so angry. I wanna cry. And here it comes. It is possible that he has discovered something that may be a threat to the new glorious world we are building. And before the goddess destroys him, we, I, must know what that is. Well, okay. That mm. makes much more sense. What happened to the uni alicorn Since that Since the goddess who claimed to know all not twenty minutes ago, Velvet Remedy muttered. Calamity nudged her with a wing. Would you kinda not go upset in the telepathic psycho guest alt? And why us? Because the secret that Red Eye seeks, the secret hidden even from the great and powerful goddess, is locked away inside a warehouse in Ministry Walk in Canterlot. Oh, so that's the place Red Eye is trying to get into. I remembered a conversation with Watcher. Yes, one of Equestria's heroes did decide that her ministry would be the Ministry of Awesome. They even built a ministry headquarters for it on Ministry Walk. After a few years, Luna ordered it crated up, and they began using the MAWHQ for storage. With controls that can only be operated by a Pegasus. 
Clever. So the goddess didn't actually need me. She needed Calamity. I wondered how Red Eye was going to get past that. And be on a shield which only a Ministry Mayor can step through. And that would be the bypass that Red Eye was trying to get through. But why did... Oh, of course. Close family or direct descendants thereof. The goddess needed Velvet Remedy as well. Once again, I was the one just clearing the way. In addition, there is one thing remaining that prevents unity. A flaw in the process that must be corrected before it can be brought to every pony in the blighted land. You know, now that I've seen what this unity is all about, I'm fine with that. That is because you are only a pony. Your kind cannot thrive in this world any longer. You merely survive, and barely at that. But my children can thrive. My children are more powerful, more capable of facing the mutated dangers of this world. The very poisons which kill you make my children stronger. Your children can't even breed, I pointed out. Every single alicorn I have seen is a mare. You have no stallions. Now, I'll agree that can be fun, but when it comes to thriving, that's a doozy of a problem. The main voice of the goddess was silent a moment. Flares and fireworks continued to explode behind her glowing, faces covered face. <clears throat> They whispered incoherently in my mind, giving me a headache. Like the goddess said, a flaw, but one which can be corrected with the right magic. Let me guess. You want Rarity's little black book. The goddess did need me after all. She needed some pony who could pick a lock. As our alicorn escorts marched us back to the Sky Bandit, all my friends were wondering the same thing I was. What now? Can you all read lips? Zenith asked. Okay, so not all of my friends were wondering the same thing. Red Eye still had me over a barrel, but... I stopped like I'd been hit in the face with a bale of hay. I lost all feeling in my hooves as one more horrid realization flooded through me. Lil Pip? Calamity asked. Something in my expression was making him look very worried. She said, Red Eye hasn't sent her any unicorns in over a year. My mind flashed back to experiences with flavors, and the little hints that Red Eye, or at least Stern, was particularly interested in unicorns. And another unicorn, too. She'll fetch a pretty price, that one. If it wasn't a unicorn, I'd say toss it back in the lake. But if Red Eye wasn't sending unicorns to the goddess, I said darkly, then he's been keeping them for himself. I turned and looked at the others in desperation. Red Eye has been talking about controlling the weather, moving the sun and the moon. He couldn't do that if he just became an alicorn. But he's not aiming to become an alicorn. He's aiming to become one of... one of... I pointed a hoof back at Maripony. One of that... The only way he could possibly hope to get that kind of power was to duplicate what happened to Trixie. And he could. He'd seen the videos. And based on his claim that the fortress in Everfree Forest was designed as a new home for the goddess, he was building a duplicate of the Maripony vats at the cathedral. He wasn't sending the goddess any unicorns, because unicorns have the strongest magic of all ponies, and he was keeping them to consume himself. Okay, that happened. Whatever the fuck that was. Oh, God, guys. Sometimes this story just takes out my internal energy right now. And it, it, it just takes a lot to understand this. Like, how? God, it still pisses me off that it's Trixie. Why did it have to be Trixie? You couldn't have made it, Twilight? who got corrupted with power? Because that's more believable than fucking Trixie. Uh, uh, God, Trixie really pisses me off. Yet again, Trixie has been corrupted by power before. But Trixie's just missed. No, no, no. You could have made it anybody. You could have made it nobody. Uh... 
Well, anyway, guys, I hope you guys enjoy this awesome episode of Fallout Quest here. There are some questions being answered here and some questions not being answered. So, anyway, guys, I'll catch you guys later, and stay nerdy, my friends. Bye.